Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. We all know why we're here. We are here because sexual assault and rape on college campuses has now reached an epidemic level across this country. And for too long, this problem has been simply swept under the rug. People refuse to talk about it, bring it out into the open. But today, we are fighting to change that, and we are joined by the leaders who have in their power to make that happen. At the request of the governor, I have traveled across this entire state for the last few months, meeting survivors, college administrators, teachers, advocates. And what I have heard from each and every one of them, they are so pleased, happy, and proud that they have a governor who has stepped up, who has made this a signature issue, who talks about it, who brings it out into the light, and actually more than talk is doing something about it. And since last October, we've had a uniform policy for our SUNY schools, which the governor will discuss. And now it is time to make it uniform across the entire state of New York. And In a few moments, you will view a, a documentary entitled The Hunting Ground. If you're like me, it's going to hit you hard. It's going to make you angry, sometimes repulsed, ultimately saddened. But in the end, it'll embolden you, it'll motivate you, it'll inspire you to join us in changing this specter in our state. And today we have with us an individual who is a champion on this cause with us as well, and that is our Majority Leader, John Flanagan. I also want to recognize a number of individuals who've joined us. We have with us the Mayor of Albany, Kathy Sheehan. Are you there, Mayor? Mayor, thank you for joining us. We have Albany County Sheriff, Craig Apple. Craig? We have Megan Greeley, an advocate from Vera House, who's joined the Governor and I many times on our journey across the state from Syracuse. Megan, Megan? And many members of the governor's cabinet, we appreciate you taking the time to join us ever since the governor announced us at a cabinet meeting last February. Thank you for your efforts and the many members of the community who joined us as well. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce, as I mentioned, another champion for this cause, our Majority Leader, John Flanagan. So thank you very much, and it is a uh, Wonderful to be here. I'm just commenting when we came out to the governor that somehow I thought I was in the wrong seat because he should be the closest one. He, of course, graciously took the seat to my right and reminded to me, me that he is on my right. So <laughs> anyway, um, we have, we're at a time right now where we have incredible amounts of work to do between now and in the end of next week. But as I was coming over and thinking about this, just put it in basic perspective. I want to thank the Lieutenant Governor for all her work. She's obviously an outspoken advocate. And I have the good fortune of working with people like Ken Laval, who's been chair of the Higher Education Committee for years. Senator Kathy Marchione has passed legislation in this area previously. And I guess the thing that I think of, it's more as a human being and as a parent, you think like, why, why do we even have to have these discussions? How could we have these problems? How could people not of like mind and good conscience come up to the solutions and why does it take as long as it does? And I think of our SUNY and CUNY systems and the publics and what we're supposed to do to protect students no matter where they may hail from. And let's bear in mind, between our public and private colleges and universities, we attract the best and brightest students from all around the world. Thank God, a lot of them are from New York State, but from all around the world. And I have three children and my baby, Ashley, who will be 27, I think if she's on a college campus, I want her to be absolutely protected, to be in the right position and never have to worry except for whether or not she's called her mother and whether or not she's doing well in school. So these issues we all take very, very seriously, and I'm confident with the governor's leadership and the lieutenant governor that we will have good, solid statutory legislation that will actually save people's lives and make a true difference in their lives. So I am humbled and grateful to be with you and amongst you, but I have the cool job. I get to introduce Megan, who is from Onondaga County, and um, I'm going to put this very simply. She has a beautiful smile. Just had a chance to meet her. She's worked at Vera House for six years as a victim advocate. And she has a human component and story to tell that will be far, far more important than whatever I have to say. But please understand, 
The Senate majority takes our role very seriously. And ladies and gentlemen, Megan Greeley. Thank you for those kind words. And thank all of you for welcoming me here tonight. Um, it's comforting to share a space with people who get it. People who understand the importance of safety, support, and validation. Thank you. Thank you to the survivors and the advocates who have worked tirelessly to provide us with great leadership as we work to change rape culture here in New York State. It takes courage for survivors to share their stories, but it also takes courage to listen, to be present with their truths. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the courage in all of us here tonight. My name is Megan Greeley, and I'm a graduate student at Syracuse University. And I'm proud to be here today with the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the Senate majority leader to talk about something that's very important to me. I am also a survivor of sexual violence. I was raped just before my senior year of high school by someone who I thought was a very close friend of mine. I trusted him, and he violated my sense of safety and my sense of self. I no longer knew who I was anymore. This crime altered every aspect of my daily life. In a year when I should have been celebrating graduation and making excited plans for college, I was instead isolating myself and battling with feelings of depression and anxiety not wanting to sacrifice my college experience or lose one more thing as a result of being raped. I signed up for classes and I moved into a dorm at a small private college in Western New York. I trusted this college to keep me safe. While in my first semester, I was asked by my resident assistant to come to his room. He wanted help on an assignment. He offered me a drink and he began to make forward sexual advances. I began by politely telling him no, but as he persisted, I became terrified. I began to feel weak and the room started to spin. I knew he had drugged me and I remembered thinking, not again. I pushed and I kicked and I rolled off his bed. He blocked the door and I struggled with him. I needed to get out of there. I needed to be safe. I'm not sure how I did it, but I got out of his room with a ripped shirt and a few bruises. I turned to my college. I was hoping that they would hold him accountable, hoping they would offer me support and safety. That was not the response I received, and I moved home after that first year. I sought therapy service at Vera House, a local nonprofit in Syracuse, which is where I now work to support survivors of sexual and domestic violence. And my experiences led me to tell my story and become an advocate for fellow victims, survivors, and their families. As a society, we need to do more. We need to do more to end this kind of violence, especially on college campuses where it is so prevalent and where students tend to assume they are safe. Sexual violence is an epidemic, and the effects of this trauma touches all of us. Today, Lady Gaga and our governor released an op-ed championing legislation that will change the ways in which we support survivors and hold perpetrators accountable. We need to have a uniform set of policies for colleges and universities to enforce when it comes to cases of sexual assault and rape. I like to think of all the ways in which my story would be different if the small private college I attended as a freshman had done what this legislation proposes. I would have known about available resources on and off campus. College administrators and support staff would have known the ways in which to respond. Maybe the man who had come very close to completing his intention of raping me, maybe he would have been held accountable no longer able to perpetrate sexual violence on other students. No student should ever have to worry that they will become a victim to the type of horrific assaults that I experienced. And just as important, any student who is victimized 
must know that their school will do everything to hold that perpetrator accountable. Last year, at the direction of Governor Cuomo, public colleges across the state implemented a universal set of policies, including affirmative consent and a student bill of rights. Private colleges need to be held to that same standard. And that's why the state legislator must pass the governor's proposal. Now, I want you to join me in welcoming our leader in this, Governor Andrew Cuomo. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. <clears throat> First to Megan Greeley, who is taking a truly negative situation in her life and turned it into a positive for others uh, and found a way to deal with her pain that actually is a value to society. Let's give her a round of applause, please. <clears throat> to our great Lieutenant Governor, who's been all over the state championing this issue, College Campuses Editorial Board, she has done a great, great job Governor Kathy Hochul, thank you. We have our new Senate leader with us, Senator John Flanagan. Uh, it's been my pleasure to, I've known the Senator obviously uh, for a number of years, but it's the first chance I've had to work with him as a leader. And I'm very excited about it. You know, our system is uh, premised on the basis that with this series of checks and balances that we call our government, that, it's, that the government will be run by people of goodwill and people of compromise and people of reasonableness. When you look at Washington and you see the gridlock, why? That's because people's politics are in place of their representation of the people. Because in gridlock, everyone loses because the government stops and progress stops. The past few years in Albany, we've been 180 degrees the other way um, because we realize that if we don't work together and if we don't compromise, then everyone loses. Senator Flanagan is a person who was cut from that cloth. He has been reasonable, he has been thoughtful, he has been helpful, he has been collegial, he has taken an interest in this issue of sexual assault on college campuses right from the get-go. Uh, and he has made it a personal priority for himself. I'm hopeful that we're going to pass a piece of legislation this session. Working together, I believe we will. I thank him very much for being here. Let's give a round of applause to Senator Flanagan. <clears throat> This film you're about to see is going to speak for itself. It is, as the Lieutenant Governor said, incredibly, incredibly powerful, and it tells the story with facts, with numbers, with data, with actual uh, victims of crimes in a truly powerful way. Uh, and it, it goes a long way in taking an abstract concept and making it a reality. This is a priority for me, this issue, maybe as a father of three young ladies, uh, maybe because the Cuomo family has a special relationship with women. My mother and father, 14 grandchildren. Of 14 grandchildren, how many would be girls proportionately? 13 of 14 girls. <laughs> no? Only one boy. My brother Christopher had a boy a week before Christmas, named the boy Mario. If he had named the boy Jesus, it would have been almost as impactful. But 13 girls, so uh, we're acutely aware of the women's movement. Plus, I grew up with some very, very strong women. Uh, and uh, that, that drives a great deal of this for me. Uh, also, the fundamental reason why we're in government, and many of us here are in government, right? Why are we in state government? Well, because they pay you a lot of money. No. Well, because the hours are great. No. Well, fame and fortune. No. Well, it's a really pleasant work environment. No. 
well, then why do we do this to ourselves? Masochism, no, why else? Because we believe and we know that government is a vehicle to actually do good things for people. And that's what makes the entire process worth it. That's what makes all the aggravation worth it, that we can leave this place a better place, and that we can use our time and use our talent not just to better ourselves, but to better our community. And that's what every religion and every philosopher comes down to. Live your life giving love and improving society. And government is a vehicle to do that. Now, sometimes we do it by educating children. Sometimes we do it by repairing a road. Sometimes we do it by showing up after a flood. Sometimes government does it by articulating a problem that hasn't been articulated. Sometimes government does it by expressing a goal that hasn't been expressed. And sometimes government does it by solving a problem that hasn't been solved. This issue, government does all of that. The first statement is, we discriminate against women in this society. I first used that line three years ago when we introduced the Women's Equality Act. And my staff said, you can't say that. I said, why not? They said, well, it's too stark for the governor of the state to say, we discriminate against women. I said, but we do. Yeah, but nobody says that. I said, well, that's why we should say it, because nobody says it. There is still inequality between men and women. That is true. We discriminate against women. That is true, and it has to be said because denial is not a life strategy, and you'll never solve a problem that you're unwilling to admit. And we, as a society, treat women differently. We do in employment, we do with a glass ceiling, we do in housing, we do in lending. We treat women differently, and there is a different power relationship when it comes to sexual activity and sexual behavior, and it starts early. Well, we've experienced sexual harassment cases right here in Albany. But it doesn't start in midlife. It starts very early. And when you see some of the behavior on college campuses, you're going to get where those patterns are set. And this state is going to stand up and say, we don't accept it. We are going to acknowledge the truth. We're going to say it's unacceptable. We're going to pose a solution. Number one. Victim's Bill of Rights. You know how they read the Miranda Bill of Rights? The Miranda Rights before they arrest you? If you are a victim of a sexual assault, these are the rights that you're going to be read on any college campus in the state of New York. <laughs> Affirmative consent. The woman must say yes. When you hear some of the garbage in this film from uh, young men, as they would call themselves on college campuses, it's going to be breathtaking. Affirmative consent, women must say uh, yes. Amnesty for students who are involved in a situation and are afraid to come forward because of liability for their own. They were uh, on their own. They were at a party. They were drinking, etc. So amnesty provision, training for all people on campuses, and then a victim of a sexual assault has a choice between contacting the campus security or law enforcement, and the state police will put together a specially trained unit with uh, primarily female counselors who can counsel a uh, potential victim of uh, their rights. Why do they have to have a right to go to law enforcement? Because campuses tend to cover up these crimes. Campuses are businesses, they are brands, they don't want newspaper stories with rapes happening on their college campuses. So they have the campus security handle it, and more than anything else, they want it to go away. They want it to go away. And they want it to go away quietly. So they tend to put pressure on the woman, the victim, not to pursue the claim. Uh, the statistics are overwhelming and breathtaking. It, it was wrong, it is institutionalized, it's socialized, and it has to stop, and New York is the place to stop it. Because New York, with all the good things we do,
One thing we've learned together over these few years, when New York stands up and acts, the nation notices. And when New York stands up and acts, every elected official all across the country, every policymaker gets asked the question, well, they did this in New York. What do you think about that? Let New York stand up this legislative session and say, we will not tolerate discrimination against women. We will not tolerate women being treated differently. We will not tolerate women being victims of sexual assault. It's wrong. It's illegal. It stops. It stops here now. And New York is going to enforce the law in a way that has never been done before. New York makes that statement. It will resonate across this nation. It will go right across the country, bounce off the West Coast, and come back to the East Coast. And you'll see all other states start to stand up and say, me too. That's the power of New York. Let's make New York a better place. Let's make this nation a better place. Hopefully, the Senator, myself, and the Assembly will pass this bill this year. With your help, we will. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you, Governor, again, for your advocacy and Majority Leader for your leadership, and Megan, particularly, for having to open up those wounds the way you did to help uh, make sure that no one else has to endure what you did. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this evening, and uh, hold on for your seats. You're in for a heck of a ride with this video. Thank you. <laughs>